our Bibles to Luke chapter number 14. Luke chapter 14. We're continuing our study here and asking ourselves the question, are you a Christian? Now before you just kind of dive right in and answer, we want not just what maybe society says as a Christian or what somebody else, a church or anybody else has told us as a Christian, we want to see what Jesus says is a Christian. Because just because we're born in America doesn't make us Christians. America is not a Christian nation. Anyone who says that it is a Christian nation doesn't understand what a Christian is. So just because we're born here doesn't make us a Christian. Some people believe that. And I've talked to people and they've given that answer. Some people believe that just because they go to a certain church or belong to a certain denomination that they are a Christian. That's not what the Bible teaches us. Some people think just because they've trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior, they are a Christian. And you can accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, you can be on your way to heaven, and still not be what the Bible calls a Christian. Saved, yes. Child of God, yes. But Christian, maybe not. And so we want to see what the Bible has to say. In Acts 11... Verse number 26, the last portion of the verse, says this, And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. So it puts a stipulation on who a Christian is and what a Christian is. It doesn't say those that trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior were called Christians. It doesn't say those that were of a certain nation were called Christians or those who were baptized were called Christians. No, it says the disciples were called Christians in Antioch. So in order to be a Christian, you have to be a disciple. So then if I'm going to figure out, am I a Christian? I first got to be a disciple. Well, what makes me a disciple of Jesus? And for that, we turn to Luke chapter number 14. And over the next few weeks, we're going to continue to look and see some things about what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, because if we're not a disciple, then we are not a Christian. Not what the Bible defines as a Christian. Let's begin reading in verse number 25. There went great multitudes with him, and he turned, this is Jesus, and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters... Yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now, since we're studying and and seeing the correlation between a disciple and a Christian, you could very easily interchange the word Christian there. He cannot be a Christian. Remember that word Christian means little Christs. We're to be reflecting Jesus to the world. And whosoever doth not bear his cross, verse number 27, and come after me, he cannot be my disciple. He is not a Christian. For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he hath sufficient to finish it? Lest happily after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold him, behold it, began to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000? Or else while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. He is not a Christian. Salt is good, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land nor yet for the dunghill, but men cast it out. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And so, in order to be a Christian, you have to be a disciple of Jesus. Now, what we looked at last week is that a disciple loves Jesus most. 
A disciple loves Jesus most. Notice verse number 26. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now, we noted that in the language that word means hate. It does mean hate, but we also noted Jesus doesn't tell us to hate. He wants us to love all people. We're commanded to. The second is like unto it. The Bible says we need to love our neighbor as ourselves. We looked at that verse. It says, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one toward another. So we are to love all people. Remember what Jesus said. You've heard, hate your enemy, love your neighbor. He says, no, we're not to hate our enemy. We're to love our enemy. So love all people. The point that we made, and, and now when I read this portion of Scripture, I get a little hungry because we talked about donuts. <laughs> and we compared donuts, remember? We've all got our different... Fa- Place, the favorite place we like to get donuts from. Mine's Krispy Kreme. Do I hate Donut Land? No, I don't. Brother Jess Doherty knows I love a good Donut Land donut from time to time. And so it's not that I hate other donut places. I just, I, Krispy Kreme's the best to me. And even going into Krispy Kreme, I could eat a lot of their donuts and enjoy them. But there's one that's the favorite to me. That is the lemon-filled glazed donut. I'm kind of sad that I don't have one sitting in front of me this week. Thought about driving two hours yesterday one way just to get one for this morning. Not that I hate the other donuts. I don't. I hate gas station donuts. I can't, Ma, she's still here. We're trying to get her changed. <laughs> gas station donuts. Get out of here with that. It's not that I hate the other donuts. I don't. I just like that one more than the others. And the point that he's making in what he's saying here is that we ought to love Jesus so much more than we love anyone else. That if you compare the loves, okay, I mentioned my wife. I love my wife more than any human on the planet. She's the most important person in the world to me. But if I were to compare my love for my wife with my love for Jesus, my love for Jesus ought to be so much greater than my love for my wife that if you compared them, it looks as if I hate my wife. It looks as if I hate my children. I'm not literally to hate them. But I ought to love Jesus most, and it shouldn't even be a close second. It says, if you don't love Jesus most, you are not, and you cannot be my disciple, and so therefore, by elimination, you are not a Christian. So if Jesus is not the most important person to you, then we ask you that question, are you a Christian? Your answer is no. I'm not a Christian. Because to be a Christian, I have to be a disciple. And if I'm going to be a true disciple, then I have to love Jesus most. Here this morning, we're going to look at the second thing. The Bible says a disciple takes up their cross. Look at verse number 27. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this portion of Scripture. God, we pray at this moment that you would speak to each of our hearts. Lord, some people here might need to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. They might need to make that decision to trust in Him and Him alone to save them from their sins and give them everlasting life. And I pray if there's someone here like that, Lord, they would stop trusting in a church or baptism, or good works, or some other thing, and they would trust in Jesus and Him alone. For you have told us, you are the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by you. Not of works, lest any man should boast. And Lord, if I were to look around, and it's based upon works, I could look around and I could say, well, I'm a pastor, I'm I'm better than they are. And I preach, and I study, and I do this, and I do that. The Lord, it's not about works. None of those things matter when it comes to salvation. And I pray they'd be saved the Bible way today. Lord, for those who are saved, who have trusted in Jesus, Lord, your desire for each and every one of us is that we would be Christians. That we would be disciples who reflect your image to the world. And I pray that you would use this series and this portion of Scripture to challenge our hearts. Lord, show us where we're failing. 
Show us where we're reflecting ourselves and our sin to the world rather than reflecting Jesus Christ. And I pray that each of us would make a decision today that we're going to be disciples of Jesus Christ, that we are going to be Bible Christians. We ask that you would do these things. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. So in Luke chapter number 14, as we talk about this second thing of what a disciple does, what a Christian does, they says they take up their cross. Once again, look to verse number 27. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now, one of the things that I want you to notice first is notice that Jesus tells us to bear our own cross, not his cross. He says, whosoever doth not bear his. He doesn't say my cross. He says his cross. And come after me cannot be my disciple. I've heard people talk about bearing Jesus' cross and claiming what he's talking about in verse number 27 is preaching the gospel and being a witness. Yes, we are to do that, but this verse doesn't teach that. He doesn't say, bear my cross. Jesus tells each of us, if we know Jesus Christ is our Savior, to bear our own crosses. So that means I have a cross to bear and you have a cross to bear, and there's a very specific meaning to that. And so... He doesn't say, bear my cross and follow me. He tells each of us to bear your cross and follow me. Some people look at Luke chapter 14 and verse number 27 like it's Luke chapter 23 and verse number 26, and that is wrong. That verse says, and as they led him away, they laid hold upon one Simon, a Cyrenian, coming out of the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. That's not what he's telling us to do here. He says, I want you to take up your cross. So if I'm going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, he tells me I've got to take up my cross. In another verse, he tells us we need to take our cross up daily. The second thing I want you to notice about this verse is when he says cross, there's one purpose for a cross. That's death. That's the only thing a cross is. It is an instrument of death, not a burden that we bear. So when he tells us that, hey, you need to take up your cross and follow me, he's not saying that this is some sort of burden that you have to bear and have to carry. We kind of misuse that phrase, that, you know, this is my cross to bear. That's not what it's talking about. It's not saying if you have a health problem that continues and persists, that that's taking up your cross for Jesus. It's not. It's not saying if you're in some sort of financial trouble that that's your cross to bear. It's not saying if you have marriage troubles and you're in a loveless marriage that that's your cross to bear. It's not saying if you have a wayward child, you're bearing that cross. No, that's not what it's all about. It's not a burden that you bear. Those are things the Lord uses in our lives to mold and shape us in the image of Jesus Christ. They're not a cross to bear. A cross is an instrument of death. So you may have different things that you struggle with, different burdens that you deal with. That's not a cross to bear. That's not what he's talking about here in Luke chapter 14 and verse number 27. Turn with me to Matthew chapter number 16. Matthew chapter number 16. Matthew chapter number 16 is most famous... For Jesus asking the question in verse number 13, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And remember, they had all kinds of different answers. Some talk about you being a prophet and a teacher and all these sort of things. Maybe Elijah or somebody like that. Then in verse 15, he asked Peter the question, Who do you say that I am? Who am I to you? That's when Peter says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, You're right. And that's the rock that I'm going to build my church on. Verse number 18 is most familiar of why we know Matthew chapter number 16. Let's look down a few verses at verse number 21. It says, From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Now notice once again, it's 
to his disciples, those that were closest to him, got the most information from him and about him. And the closer you were to him, the more he revealed. And that's still true. You want to know more about who God is, you draw close to him and he'll draw close to you, the Bible tells us. You want to know God, you want to have a deep relationship with him, he will reveal himself to you. He will fellowship with you. But we have to be willing to make count the cost to walk with him closely. And so it, it says here, he reveals that to him. He's going to be killed, be raised again the third day in verse 21. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be done unto thee. And boy, you see Peter's personality come out. He's just got that personality. If he says it, it's coming out. Sometimes it's a great thing. You know, you're Christ, the Son of the living God. Or, hey, Jesus, if it's really you, let me come out of the boat and walk on the water. There's times where it does some great things. And there's some times where it really bites him in the rear end, like it does right here. He said, Lord, no. He, and he, it's not just that he says, no, it's not going to happen. He rebukes Jesus for saying that. He scolds him for it. This shall not be done unto thee, he says. And we know Peter was willing to put his own life on the line to make sure Jesus didn't die. As there in the garden, they tried to arrest him. What did he do? He drew his sword and he went to kill someone in defending Jesus. Verse 23, but he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, thou art an offense unto me. Notice what he says here. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. And this is one of the reasons why you and I aren't the disciples that we're supposed to be. This is the reason right here. We're not willing to take up our cross. We're not willing to die to ourselves because we care more about the things of men. We care more about the things of this world than we care about the things of God. That's what it boils down to. Jesus said, if you love me, you're going to keep my commandments. Piggybacking off of what we talked about last week, you have to love him most. Loving him most means doing what he said to do. And in this moment, you know, Peter thinks he's doing the right thing. He's protecting Jesus. He wants to preserve his life. But that wasn't God's plan. A lot of times we care more about our own plans and what we think is best rather than what God thinks is best. God does allow hurts to come into our life to teach us some things. God does allow difficulty and death and hardship to come so that we might learn and grow and trust in Him. But see, a lot of times we care more about the things of God or more about the things of man, rather than the things of God. What I care about is getting over this sickness as quickly as I can. And if I don't, then I'm blaming God. I care more about getting out of this financial hardship the quickest way that I can, rather than learning to trust and depend upon Him. I care more about my sin, and calling the shots of my own life, rather than doing what He wants me to do. He says, you care, you don't savor the things of God, you savor the things of men. He says, that's when you're most like Satan. And rather than being a Christian, a little Christ, a lot of times, we're more like little Satans running around. Because we care more about the things of the here and now, rather than things of eternity. And it doesn't take long for us to look into our lives to decide what's the most important thing to us. You look where you spend most of your time and I'll tell you what's important to you. You look where you spend most of your money and I will show you what's important to you. You look and I'll look and see where we spend most of our talent that God has given to us and we'll see what's important to us. It's one thing to say that we love God and we want to follow Him and we're a Christian. It's another thing to actually flesh it out with our lives. And a lot of times we're not Christians, even though we say that we are. We're little Satans running around. 
And rather than seeing Jesus in us by the way that we live our lives and what we say and what we do, they see the devil and they see our sin and they see our selfishness. Because we savor the things of the here and now rather than the things of God. And he continues on in verse 24, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? So just to make sure that we understand that a cross means death, he explains it to us in these verses. Now, immediately when, they said, when he said cross to the disciples, they knew it. They knew what a cross is for. On a regular basis, going in and out of the city, they would have watched as different criminals hung on the cross and died there. They knew what a cross was all about. If you saw someone carrying a cross, you knew one thing, they're not coming back. Because they're going to die. Jesus wasn't telling His disciples that they were going to have to bear some burden. He was telling them to die to themselves and that He would give them life. He makes sure that we understand what He's talking about is death here. In verse 25, Whosoever will save his life shall lose it. You don't want to take up your cross every day and die to yourself? You're going to lose your life. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. You want to die to yourself? You want to take up your cross and be a disciple of Jesus Christ? He said, you will find a life that you could not possibly imagine on your own. In Galatians chapter 2, verse number 20 is a verse that we often quote, but maybe don't understand. It says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. And the Apostle Paul, what he's saying is, hey, listen, I'm willing to take up my cross every single day to follow Jesus Christ. I'm willing to die to myself and allow Jesus Christ to live through me so that it's no longer Paul they see, but it's Jesus Christ they see. That ought to be the cry of every one of our hearts. My cry ought to be, Lord, I'm willing to die to myself. I'm willing to take up my cross. I don't want people to see Thomas. Lord, I want people to see Jesus Christ when they look at me. When they interact with me, when they hear me, I want them to see and hear and experience Jesus. That's what it means to be a Christian. It's that people don't see you and me anymore. They see Jesus. Why? Because I'm dead to myself. I'm alive to God. Turn with me to Romans chapter number 6. Romans chapter number 6. We'll look at verse number 6. It says, knowing this. Okay, so this is a sure thing. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then he goes on and talks about not letting sin reign over us, not yielding our members to sin, but instead yielding our members as instruments of righteousness. He says you need to die to sin and die to self. That that sin should no longer have a place and a hold in our lives. The people should no longer see me living in sin and wickedness and filth. Those things are done away with. And we spent some time last year looking at those sins that we ought to put to death in our lives. 
Those things are dead. They're gone. And people should not see that as a part of my life anymore. Those things are dead, he says, and then we're alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. See, the, we, need, we need to get to the other side of the coin. Because a lot of times we want to talk about dead to sin, dead to sin, put away sin, put away sin. But we, need to ha- we need to deal with the other side as well. I'm alive to God. And I love how Paul puts it as he's talking about these different sins that we get away with. Put away lying and speak truth with your neighbor. And he, he deals with the sin that needs to be put to death. And he says, but you need to be alive to truth. You need to be alive to righteousness. You need to be alive to kindness, alive to forgiveness. What we're allowing is we're allowing Jesus Christ to live through us. That I'm dead. People no longer should see me. They should see Jesus. Going back to what that word Christian means, little Christ, no longer should they see you. They should see Jesus. Think about this song that Miss Paulette sings from time to time. I, I almost called her this morning and asked her to sing it. I know she would have, but it would not have been fair of me to put her on the spot in such short notice. The song by Joy Williams that says, Do they see Jesus in me? It says, Is the face that I see in the mirror the one I want others to see? Do I show in the way that I walk in my life the love that you've given to me? My heart's desire is to be like you, and all that I do, all I am. Do they see Jesus in me? Do they recognize your face? Do I communicate your love and your grace? Do I reflect who you are in the way I choose to be? Do they see Jesus in me? Second verse says, It's amazing that you'd ever use me, but use me the way you will. Help me to hold out a heart of compassionate grace, a heart that your spirit fills. May I show forgiveness and mercy the same way you've shown it to me. Now I want to show all the world who you are, the reason I live and breathe. So you'll be the one that they see when they see me. Do they see Jesus in me? Do they recognize your face? Do I communicate your love and your grace? Do I reflect who you are and the way I choose to be? Do they see Jesus in me? I ask you the question. Are you a Christian? Do you love Jesus more than you love anyone else? The answer to that question is is no, then you are not a Christian because you are not his disciple. Have you taken up your cross to follow Jesus? Have you died to yourself? I'm no longer about what I want to do, what I think is right. It's all about Jesus Christ now. I'm dead to myself. I'm alive to God. And I want to reflect Jesus Christ to the world. So they no longer see me. They see the Lord Jesus Christ. If you have not died to yourself, then you are not a Christian. If you are not alive to God, then you are not a Christian. It says you need to take up your cross and Follow Jesus, verse 27 of Luke chapter number 14. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. He says, you've got to die die to yourself and you've got to learn to follow me. And as we follow Jesus, it's then that he changes and transforms and conforms us to the person that he wants us to be. We have to die to ourselves. Are you a Christian? You need to take up your cross and follow Jesus today.